Section 1 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns The New Witness, 1919-1920 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. F. Parks G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns The New Witness, 1919-1920 by G. K. Chesterton Section 1. November 21st, 1919. At the sign of the world's end, echoes of the last strike. I have always counseled the young to be kind to bishops, and I differ from the satiric version of them which amounts to saying that all is gas and gaiters. Mr. Wells gave an amusing account of the soul of a bishop, and I have my doubts about the sea of the bishop, and I suspect it was rumpty food. The same great writer has said more seriously in one of the most fascinating of his first social essays that the bishops, socially so much in evidence, are intellectually in hiding. But I do not think it is half so true of such clerical dignitaries as it is of civil ones. A man like Dr. Gore is much more intellectually in the open than a man like Mr. George. Dr. Gore's Anglo-Catholic principle, whether right or wrong, can be stated, and he states it. What principle does a politician ever state, let alone stand by? When the bishop states a conclusion, he makes it clear, though he may not make it fashionable. When the premier states a conclusion, it is fashionable to make a fuss of it, but it is impossible to make sense of it. The politician who could reply, as Mr. George did, to the liberal candidate on the question of liberalism is intellectually in hiding under the bed or up the chimney. He said, apparently, that nothing should sever him from the principles of liberalism, but that the time had not yet come to resume our party hostilities, since the nation still needs our united help. There is nothing exceptionally wrong in this. It might be found in any twenty leading articles or speeches, and how futile it is. Does our country ever cease to need our sincere efforts? Is it ever right to divide the nation into factions frivolous and unmeaning? How soon may we take a holiday and play havoc with all human institutions? He talks as if the time once was, and will soon be again, when we need think of nothing in life but the buff and blue rosettes of a carnival, and buff would then be his color. But if it is not a mere question of buff and blue, it must be some sort of question of right and wrong. If the differences are not frivolous, they are presumably differences about how to help the country, differences about what does help the country. If men really agreed about that, there never would have been any parties. If men really differ about that, there can never be any combination of parties. The coalition would mean one man adding his efforts to save the country to another man's efforts to ruin it. By this theory, there is one huge, staring, self-evident public good we could all join in doing whenever we liked, but which we never do except at desperate moments, spending the rest of our lives in pretending to differ when we don't. I hardly know if the politician looks worse if this is true or if it is false, but I only take this as a typical tag of a politician, and I doubt if anyone can find any train of thought so tangled in any utterance of any bishop. But just as I am moved to this comparative compliment to the Episcopal bench, I encounter one extraordinary exception. It is still, I think, an exception, whereas Mr. George is no worse than many other politicians. But all the same, an able and respected bishop, Dr. Weldon, seems actually to have talked as much nonsense as any of our enlightened newspapers or of any of our progressive public men. The bishop is reported, perhaps by his enemies, as saying in so many words that such a thing as the railway strike was morally the same as the invasion of Belgium. I fear there can hardly be any mistake about a thing so enormous, any more than about his riding to his cathedral on an elephant. Therefore, after a brief struggle with my Episcopal sympathies, I conclude that he did say it, and I can only contemplate it with a sort of despair, as if a mountain had suddenly appeared in my garden. The bishop had not thought out any real ethical reason for thinking the invasion of Belgium wrong. In other words, that he does not really think the invasion of Belgium wrong. Anyhow, he does not see its wrong on the same scale as I do, or so crazy a comparison would never even have crossed his mind. It is enough, of course, to state a single and simple example what the comparison involves. When the bishop was a vicar, we will suppose that he had a curate, 
or three curates, and that one or all of these curates complained of their salaries and resigned their positions with a haste which their vicar honestly thought inconsiderate and unfair. According to the moral pronouncement of the bishop, this conduct of the curates is really the same as if they had broken into the vicar's house at night, cut the throats of the housemaid and the housekeeper, tied the vicar up so as to be able to torture him, taken away half his wealth and valuables in a wheelbarrow, and then explained that they had only burgled the vicarage because it was a shortcut to burgling the church next door. If the curates did all this, they would only be acting on the same moral principle which had moved them to ask for a little better payment, and this, although the whole world knew that curates were abominably badly paid. This, as far as I can understand it, is the ethical principle which the ecclesiastical authority has laid down, and the reason added renders it all the more remarkable. The authority said, apparently, that the two things were the same because the English strikers resembled the German soldiers in that they used force, to which it seems sufficient to reply that they did not. I wish somebody would explain to me what in the world people really mean when they talk perpetually about a strike being an appeal to force. As a fact, a striker is not using force upon anybody. He is simply ceasing to use force upon anything. What I suppose they mean, if they could only say it, is that he is threatening people with consequences that are physical and not merely moral. The striker does this. And so does the employer and the arbiter and the government when it doubles the parts of the arbiter and employer. If the striker tacitly threatens to starve out the purchaser, so does the employer tacitly threaten to starve out the striker. Both, if they are humane, may hope that the threat will be enough, but both threaten bodily and not merely mental things. So does the curate threaten the vicar with bodily fatigue when he asks for something approximating to bodily sustenance. The comparison between a threat involved in all bargaining and the barbarian deluge of 1914 will do one thing and one thing only. It will give the pacifist labor men an excellent excuse for saying that we never saw any serious or spiritual condemnation resting on the tyrants of Europe, that we only cursed what interfered with our own snobbish comfort and convenience as we might curse a cat or a dog or a stool or a working man. For the rest, I can conceive no more direct incitement of the populace to armed revolt than the statement that there is no difference between that and the legal and logical collective bargain. You may as well be hung for a sheep as a lamb, and you may as well be anathematized for a revolution as for a strike. If a striker cannot logically be shocked at the Germans invading Belgium, he certainly need not shrink from the much nobler novelty of the English invading England. But if this be true of all strikes, it is rather specially true of the recent railway strike. On that occasion, the upper and middle classes missed an opportunity of seeing daylight and doing justice, which may never recur. And a mark was put against them in the proletarian mind, which may be remembered with serious results. For that strike should have been supported, because it was in a very special sense a legitimate strike. It was not only not revolutionary in its method, but it was not revolutionary in its aim. It was not even political in its aim. It was in marked contrast with the combinations that had been threatened touching intervention in foreign things or even nationalization of domestic things. It was a strike on a fair point of wages, and the trades unionists now naturally conclude that those who do not want a trade union used for that purpose on that occasion do not want it used for any purpose on any occasion. And they are right. These people do not want the trade union to exist at all. The question now is not how these guilds shall be directed, but whether they shall be destroyed. It may be relevant to reply here to a correspondent who has asked us why we say that the unions should be supported at any cost, though we differ from the collectivism which many of them demand. The answer is that when we say at any cost, we really mean that there is a cost that it is, in a sense, a choice of evils. A Fabian fuss of transferring powers on paper will do no good, but it will not do so much harm as the capitalist completion of the servile state by the utter ruin of the guilds. The nationalization will only be sham nationalization, but the slavery will be real slavery. So long as the trade brotherhoods exist, they can be converted to a more human social philosophy, but when once they are gone, all power will pass, not to misunderstood minorities of old radicals or new distributists, but simply to the millionaires. 
the unions will probably provide a plain test and proof both of their theoretic inconsistency and their practical utility. I will wager that when they are part of the state, they will still strike against the state. It will be bad collectivism, but it will be good common sense. When a government department oppresses them, as it will, they will treat it as a common, not to say vulgar, employer, for their instincts will be more liberal than their ideals. But nothing and nobody will strike against the state when it is really the servile state. The employers have declared war to regain all the omnipotence they had when there were no trade unions at all, and their first defiance was the late demonstration during the railway strike. End of section one. Recorded by J. F. Parks. Section two of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns. The New Witness, 1919 to 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeremiah Tyler. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919 to 1920, by G. K. Chesterton. Section 2 Tag Tug and the Tree of Knowledge. A sense of stupidity can easily descend on and darken the brain. As when I, for one to say that I do not understand this or that, I do not necessarily imply the suspicion that there is nothing to be understood. In all sincerity, or stupidity, there are many of my own affairs that I do not understand. This paper is in theory, and theories, an affair of mine. But I have not either the training or the time to understand all of it. I fear I am a little vague, for instance, about the quarrel between two brilliant young writers who have brightened my existence, Mr. Scott Moncrief and Mr. Nichols. But I am very glad it has now ended in friendly apologies, for at one time it seemed a little alarming. When it comes to the soldiers of the Great War being respectfully reproached with their glorious wounds and maladies, a new and curious kind of controversy becomes possible. It is as if one of them should denounce the other as notorious DSO, and the latter goaded to fury, should expose the former as secretly indulging in a Victoria Cross. Apropos of such limitations, I should like to thank Mr. Heron Lepper for his far too generous review of my hasty notes on Ireland, while assuring him that I should not myself have made so serious a display of the book, and I hope he will take its prominence as something due to him and not to me. But there are not only practical, but also theoretic things that I honestly do not understand, and one of them is a certain kind of scientific statement which the rationalist implicitly suggests that he does not understand. In the Observer the other day, I came upon an instance of the scholarly information which puzzles a popular intelligence. It is in a very interesting article by a learned man, Professor Sace, on the old Babylonian, or rather it seems, Sumerian version of the story of Adam. The sentence runs thus. The Sumerian name of the prototype and eponym of the human race was Tagtug, or as it was usually pronounced, Utu. Now I have no doubt that there is an explanation of this. But I think an explanation is required. If I were learned enough to instruct the general reader in such things, I should instruct him a little more. If I had to say that my family name was Chesterton, pronounced Ubabu, I should have a sense that some further inquiries might be made. If I had to introduce a man by the name of Smith, and to assure everybody that it was pronounced Brown, 
I should anticipate a certain faint surprise and curiosity following the communication. I should be moved either to linger on the paradox or to leave it out, but I do not doubt that Professor Sace mentions it thus casually because the fact is connected with other facts with which he is quite familiar. But the fact for the ordinary reader, without any further explanation, savors a little too much of that American philologist who complained that we spell a word B E A U C H A M P and call it chumley. But the mystification of the mere outsider goes beyond the superficial wonder about why a man with a fine, firm, expressive name like Tagtug should have consented to be addressed by so sentimental a pet name as Utu. There is also the problem involved in the very antiquity and obscurity of the subject. How can Professor Sace be so exceedingly certain about how people who lived before the Babylonians pronounced a word as distinct from how they wrote it? Has he wandered about among the prehistoric Sumerians, forlornly and fruitlessly calling out, Tag Tug! to find their faces light up at last with recognition when it occurred to him to pronounce it Utu? When the archaeologist found the ruins of Nippur, the cuneiform tablet simply and conspicuously inscribed Tagtug, what echoes of old Sumerian conversation still lingered in those ruins, faintly repeating Utu? as with ghostly voices like horns of elfland faintly blowing? I repeat that I readily believe there is an answer to these questions. I readily believe that the professor is right. But I am not writing to point out that the professor is wrong, but rather to point out that the modern reader is wrong when he supposes that his own scientific reading is based on reason or even consists of statements in themselves reasonable. There are few of the things called the mysteries of religion that I myself find so mystifying as that single sentence. There are few of the things controversially cited as the contradictions of Scripture that I find so inherently contradictory. Now, Professor Sace himself writes at the beginning of the article as if all our views of scriptural texts and even of religious mysteries had been revolutionized and rationalized by this very type of information. Science, he says, has obliged us to change our ideas, not only of the age and origin of man himself, but also of the origin of evil and of such theological problems as the consciousness of sin. This silent revolution of ideas has been assisted by the discovery and decipherment of the ancient records of the Near East. In short, our attitude to our own sin is altered by the discovery that the Sumerians called Adam Tagtug, when clarified and simplified by the further discovery that they called Tagtug Utu. I do not know how others feel after this exposition and enlightenment, but in my own private psychology, such theological problems as the consciousness of sin stick pretty much where they were. For my part, I do not think that poor old Tagtug, let alone Adam, can be dismissed so easily. Yet the immemorial civilization of the Near East, so old it seems always to have been civilized, like the camel, has a tradition that the first men began to fall away from some high standards set for them from the start. I think that tradition is truer than history as well as philosophy, than most of the half-educated and tenth-rate talk about evolution. If successive cults and cultures, one older than another, all lead back to one idea that man held happiness on a condition, and is unhappy through breaking that condition, I think they lead a long way nearer 
the truth of human psychology than the little bustling journeys of popular science. What in such stories is symbolic? What's sacred? What beyond contemporary comprehension I do not know, nor has any theologian yet asked me to accept on faith the fact that Adam was pronounced bingo. Professor Sace tells us that the Babylonian story mentions more than one tree, eight, I think, but I think he cannot see the truth for the trees. He tells us that the Babylonian version, as distinct from the Hebrew one, the flood was coincident with the fall as well as consequent on the fall. But I find it much more interesting that they agree about why it came than they differ about when it came. In abstract, and as a matter of personal taste, therefore, Tag Tug is good enough for me. I think this ancient and mysteriously suggestive story a very suitable starting place for that real evolution that ends in the best practical morality that I know. I should be quite content, if necessary, to say that in Tag Tug all died, so long as I could still say that in Christ all were made alive. But Tag Tug himself, even when pronounced Utu, is perhaps a little lacking in all this later and more living historical justification. He is not what you might call a name to conjure with now, however you pronounce him. And of the two versions of an exceedingly tenable tradition, I may be pardoned for adhering to the one which is not only true as a poem, but has in a sense come true as a prophecy. But whether or no I am right in accepting such mystical assumptions, my point here is that fashionable scientific culture makes assumptions every bit as mystical, and states them, as in the case of Utu, in language very much more mystifying. Whatever may be said about the Sumerian or Semitic story of the origin of man, there is not much more real logic or real evidence in the version of the origin of man now taught to thousands of people under the title of science. Mr. Wells has not got so far as man in his history of man, which we all anticipate with such pleasure, but his publisher has adorned the cover of the first issue with a picture of primitive man as now conceived. In so far as primitive man is a man, he is more or less modeled on a butler having a bath, but he is made primitive by being flattened and brutalized so as to look like a frog. There is the same scientific evidence for this picture as there is for the godlike and golden-haired Adam of Paradise Lost. But I know that multitudes seeing that picture will think it is science and the other only poetry. For the rest, many theories of evolution have appeared and have collapsed, as the whole scientific theory of the cosmic basis is said to have collapsed. And if I were writing a human history professedly concrete and outside controversy, I should not begin on any disputed or dissolving Darwinian hypothesis, any more than I should begin with Tagtug and his eight trees, or Adam and his two trees. I should say that human civilization was too old to test even its own oldest traditions, and that the wisest were doubtful about the origin of man, as about the origin of matter. In short, I should be an agnostic, a thing almost unknown nowadays. And I should add that outside this mystery there are two things. There is faith, and there is fancy. The former refers to some religion, and the latter produces what the Victorian poet called with unconscious irony, the fairy tales of science. End of section two. Tag Tug and the Tree of Knowledge. Recording by Jeremiah Tyler.
Section 3 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919-1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919-1920, by G. K. Chesterton at the sign of the world's end a ghost of a notion i have been staring at the fire instead of beginning this article the firelight that seems like a red shadow or rather foreshadowing of christmas for some reason i cannot dismiss the season from my fancy though i shall probably have to write much more about it before it comes sophists especially when they are skeptics are only too fond of saying, like Mr. Josiah Lambkin, that truth is a gem of many facets. They often forget that a gem can have facets because it is a stone, and an exceptionally solid stone. It is certainly so with that mighty and mysterious ruby of the Christmas ritual, which is as flamboyant as any bonfire, and as crimson as any sunset, but which does not fade when we follow it, like a spark or melt when we meet it like a cloud it has countless aspects because it is a solid and there will always be plenty of things to say about it it is because the group that makes christmas great is really there that art has seen it in a hundred postures and philosophy considered it in a hundred phases the special aspect that affects me just now can best be seen perhaps in the old practice of telling ghost stories round a christmas fire i mean all that older and more popular spiritualism in which the spirits knock on the door and not on the table at christmas there are nobler uses for a table than table wrapping but none of these simplicities which are also subtleties are more subtle than this particular mood of the combination of enjoyment of feasts with the enjoyment of fear the ghost stories are fairy stories they are not taken seriously, and yet they are in a sense taken sympathetically. There is nothing that strikes the unique note of this tradition so clearly as does the domestication of the dead. Anyhow, the new psychical investigators can never manage to strike that note. They offer ideals, and they sound vapid. They offer details, and they sound vulgar. The old ghost stories are not vulgar even when they are grotesque and sometimes they are not grotesque, but grave and touching. I remember hearing a ghost story at some Christmas fireside, of which I have forgotten all other details, except that a shadow was seen to cross the patch of sunshine on a church wall at the moment when the congregation said the words, In the resurrection of the body. And perhaps that is where the truth of the matter lies, that Christmas is one of the rare meetings of the body and the soul, when they can meet as friends and not foes and therefore perhaps the fancy unconsciously flies to that far-off meeting promised in those mysterious words for they are admittedly even more mysterious to those who believe than those who do not and yet such a mystery seems to hold the secret of sanity compare this union of flesh and spirit as it can be felt in the old christian feast with all recent analysis of it whether by the new theology or the new religions in a sense they defeat each other for the new theology is removing miracles at one end while the new religion is adding them at the other but both touch this mystery of the body in a way that can only be called comically incompetent even those who do it are highly competent in other ways here is a single sentence for instance from a recent book by dr inge called for some reason the gloomy dean i find him rather obscure than gloomy but the obscurity here is common to many other well-informed people the modern mind may be only a mystery when it seems to me to be a muddle but if any one can make me see the point of this particular sentence and many like it he will have solved the enigma of my existence dr inge's phrase runs i cannot pretend to myself that the belief in a resurrection of our bodies stands where it did and in the name of all the angels and devils where did it stand these people talk as if a dead man come alive after a thousand years 
had stood in the middle of the street like a lamp-post and our fathers and grandfathers had walked past him every day of their lives it is implied that the great christian miracle was a thing comparatively commonplace to the christians whom it flung from their horses tore from their homes and trades rolled on red-hot coals or tossed into blazing oil but that we have recently begun to think that there is something a little odd about it and it is specially implied that there is something very scientific and illuminating which we know and our fathers did not know about the particular doctrine of the resurrection of the body i will not pause upon the typical trick of referring to resurrection as resuscitation it has all the marks of the mode of which i speak it is entirely useless except to convey a frigid superciliousness and a faint sneer it sounds scientific but like most terms that sound scientific it is almost incredibly inaccurate no mystic ever suggested no madman ever suggested that the dead who have been dust for centuries would even be resuscitated it is a term generally used for reviving something that is almost dead or barely dead or at least very recently dead it is often used for instance of people pulled out of the sea nobody i think proposes to render first aid to the bones of charlemagne or to force breathing exercises on the mummies in the british museum but of course the word resuscitation will always serve as an alternative to resurrection whenever the scientific men find themselves forced to accept resurrection if charlemagne with his great white beard rode on a great white horse down the streets of paris to-morrow they could still say that it was only one of the well-known phenomena of resuscitation and if the mummy of rameses broke out of its own glass case and led a chase down new oxford street it would be pointed out that the study of resuscitation was literally advancing by leaps and bounds for it does not matter so much whether we despise our fathers for having been more psychic or less psychic so long as we despise them so long as it is earnestly and carefully made clear that they were not so clever as we are it will not make much difference whether they were stupid to believe in a thing so extraordinary as resuscitation or stupid not to know a thing so common as resuscitation now were the sons of men ever so ignorant in any age that they did not know that a dead man rots as a matter of fact men in rude ages probably saw him not much more often than we do it is much more likely to have been a truth known to every man woman and child in the days of small cities sacked by enemies or swept by plagues the boast benighted barbarians must have seen hills of corpses rotting in the sun and what a rot it is to talk as if we had discovered rot yet that is the very simple matter involved in talking about the resurrection of dead men standing where it did the hill of corpses does not stand where it did because it has decayed to dust and we cannot teach anything about decay to the men who saw it decaying a barbarian could see a baby could see that the corpse could not be restored except by a miracle as an act as divine and unique as the creation of the world we may or may not believe they might or might not believe in such a divine origin either of resurrection or creation but they had no more reason to believe it than we have and we have no more reason to disbelieve it than they had for both it must be something entirely outside the world which it creates or recreates it belongs wholly to the realm of religion and its true logical statement would need a treatise on religion but its imaginative and emotional statement is similar to that of christmas it is the reconciliation of the flesh and spirit it is the strange suggestion that the romance of the world cannot really have ended well unless the soul and the body like two lovers can meet at last but the irony is more intense when we check the new theology by the new religion and the old-fashioned materialism by the new-fashioned spiritualism in the most recent religion run by scientific professors and medical men the idea of bodily survival does not stand where it did because it stands on its head and kicks its legs in the air cuts capers and turns somersaults in triumph self-confidence we are assured not merely of the resurrection of the body but of the brassy and niblick 
and the whiskey and soda at the golf club religious progress not only will not stand where it did but will not even go where it was going but i think it is not going the way we wish to go the change from a cockney scepticism to a cockney spiritualism has all the curtness and crudity of both and what it misses is exactly that more mellow humor which has told tales about spirits in the red twilight of the christmas fireside there is the real spirit in which to take such tales if we are to take them at all then the spirits are only as the heathen called them the shades they are the shadows dancing on the wall where they are flung by the firelight but we are more certain about the gold and scarlet of the fire than we are about the grey shadows while the new inquirers grasp at shadows when they are still seeking for a flame end of section three Section 4 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919-1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Hand. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919-1920 by G. K. Chesterton. Christmas and the new negations last week i wrote a rather rambling criticism with a text from christmas and on this more formal occasion i shall again make the mistake of being too controversial for a christmas number mr theodore maynard has noted the same danger in connection with his excellent book of drinking songs it is inappropriate but it is also inevitable when scientific reformers go a little further and forbid flowers as they do flagons there will be a similar battle of the flowers. When they warn the poets against the roses because the thorns scratch, the poets will probably scratch too. And so in the case of Christmas, it is perhaps inevitable that our holly should be a little prickly. It is inevitable that we should hang up our stockings a little too much as the bombast furioso hung up his boots. There was an age of innocence when my colleagues and I could be less combative about Christmas as about everything else. I trust there was a time when Mr. Maynard himself was content with the mistletoe bough and had never yet carved a cudgel out of the laurel tree. I trust that there were Christmas mornings when Mr. Scott Moncrief found something else in his Scottish stocking besides his highly Scottish dirk. I apologize for taking liberties with the names of distinguished contributors, but my salute must be excused by the sentiments of the season, when special revels should be held at the sign of the tankard of ale, and the log roller's hut ought to be illuminated. My purpose is festive rather than personal. If I am rolling a log, it is only the Yule log. I say it is inevitable that even our revels should be held too much in a spirit of defense and even defiance. The Christmas household has been a besieged castle since the time of the Puritans, and it was only as one stage of a ceaseless war that the great Dickens raised the siege moreover such a religious festival seems to many to stand to-day in a ring of rivals nevertheless it seems to me a much stranger fact that in a practical sense it has no rival when men say that christmas hands on heathen traditions they pay it a compliment curiously enough which nothing else except christmas now deserves christmas really does something which the ancient heathens did but which the modern heathens cannot do Christmas is still a time of doing things and not only talking about theories. There is, in the true sense, a Christian pantomime, a self-expression by action. It means what Our Lady's tumbler meant when he stood on his head before the altar and said, I adore you with my heart and body, feet and hands. But the modern spirit has not the moral courage to make any festive formalities to express its faith. It cannot create a custom. It can only put into metaphors what its ancestors could at least put into mummeries. The agnostics often speak symbolically of an altar to the unknown god, but they do not build one. The ancient Athenians did. Even when they had nothing but agnosticism to express, they were so active that they managed to express it. Even their ignorance was creative. Even their negative was positive. It is not even impossible to imagine the sort of emblems of shrouded faces or lifted fingers of silence in which Greek art might have graven or depicted it. 
It is only in the modern mind that ignorance is also impotence. It cannot find or dare not carry out any ritual of its religion of doubt. Herbert Spencer said that music could be made the best expression of his worship of the unknowable. But he did not establish a first-rate brass band to do it before a shrine in Hyde Park. And no one would have been more surprised than he, if when taking his meticulous constitutional in that enclosure, he had heard the sounds of harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, and seen the fashionable company bowing down to some enormous image of the unknowable, or at any rate of the unrecognizable. Mr. H. G. Wells refers to the Creator as the Veiled Being, but he is not really recognized as a Veiled Being, as Isis really was recognized as a Veiled Being. He would be mildly surprised if the veil appeared in painting and sculpture as well as in language and literature. He might even be momentarily disturbed if men turned so airy a metaphor into marble, and I feel sure he would be quite annoyed if he suddenly found himself in a great temple opposite a veiled image whose veil he was forbidden to lift. Mr. Wells, of all the men in the world, would most certainly want to lift it. But this paralysis of artistic activity, if I may so describe it, is not only typical of those modern creeds that are avowedly indefinite, it is also typical of those that are definite. It is not easy, perhaps, for Christian science to produce anything very vivid in the way of art. The author of The Path to Rome observed, in a moment of discomfort, that it was difficult for an artist to draw pain in the foot and knee. Perhaps it would be still more difficult to draw the absence of pain in the foot and knee. Christian science has produced a newspaper, but I do not think it has produced a book. Science and health is bound between covers and might be said to be cast in literary form, if it were not rather cast in literary formlessness. Certainly I do not envy the rising draftsmen who should be employed to illustrate it. I believe it to be the same with sculpture as with drawing and writing. The Christian scientists have money enough to load the earth and darken the sky with monuments. But I have not seen anywhere as yet an allegory statuary group of Mrs. Eddy, supported by her husbands. And since this creed does not cultivate these more elaborate arts, it goes without saying that it does not cultivate the simple and even spontaneous art of ceremonial. What is true of the rather faded fashion of Christian science is also true of the fresher fashion of spiritualism. Spiritualism, in a sense, has doctrines, it certainly has miracles, but it does not strictly have ceremonies, and therefore it does not have arts. Here again, it does not merely differ from Christianity, but from that common human need which was satisfied by Christianity. As a matter of mere historical imagination, I make the guess that if spiritualism had appeared in another age, its mere machinery would have been less cheap and cheerless. The tables that are turned by spirits would not have been turned out from factories, one exactly like another. They would have been carved and colored and inlaid like altars, with individual craftsmanship. Imaginative instinct would have seized, for instance, on the accident that the planchette is generally made in the shape of a heart, and would have turned it into a symbol. The pencils of the spirit artists would themselves have been artistic, and even the tambourines might have been musical. I suspect that even the tying up of the medium with ropes would have been a ritual like the binding of some ancient victim, not only with fillets, but with garlands. But in the actual atmosphere, all this is very difficult to imagine, as difficult as to imagine Sir Arthur Conan Doyle suddenly making his appearance in a towering mitre, or the strangely figured vestments of some lost cult of antiquity. And I've tried hard to imagine that, with no result except exhaustion. Hence, in preserving the proper ceremonials of Christmas, we are preserving, among other things, something that has certainly been normal to most nations and ages, but which is abnormally neglected in our present industrial decline. We may say with pride that we are preserving something heathen, for we are preserving something human. It is the more emancipated world all round us that is becoming relatively inhuman. Men, if they have no other gods, might at least have household gods, as the heathens did and where the house is a temple, it will have rights like those of Christmas. Today, the tendency is for the legislator and lawyer to break up the householder's functions and distribute them among institutions, just as their master, the usurer, breaks up the householder's furniture and distributes it among the pawn shops. It may yet be amusing to watch Christmas itself being cut up in this way. A family will no longer be allowed to toast chestnuts and tell fairy tales at the same time. The fairy tales will be taught in the state school and will be called folklore. 
the chestnuts will be served at the communal restaurant and will be called vegetarianism. All information about holly and mistletoe can be obtained from the Department of Instruction in Botany. For sections of the Yule Log showing stages in the growth of the tree, the young student must inquire in the arboreal section of the same department. Hundreds of stockings will be hung up in rows like waterproofs in a cloakroom to be covered by tickets. The game of Snapdragon will present a certain difficulty owing to a conflict between scientific realism and teetotal morality. But the world will watch with keen interest the patient experiment of Professor Pook in his effort to set fire to lemonade. But perhaps it is more likely that they will simply let it alone, that these ancient rites will remain only among the desolate and oppressed, and an enlightened citizen will pause with a face of disgust outside some dark and squalid hovel, out of which will come, like the cry of some prehistoric beast, the horrible sound of human laughter. End of section 4Section 5 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919 to 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Hand. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919 to 1920, by G. K. Chesterton. The Horn of the Hero After reading Mr. Scott Moncrief's complete translation of The Song of Roland, one of the most remarkable and valuable adventures and achievements of modern letters, I happened to fall into a sort of rambling reverie which ended with the reflection that our civilization is condemned by the way in which a groom touches his hat to a gentleman. The logical connection may not be very apparent. I am not touching my hat to Captain Scott Moncrief, but sending him, I hope, a far heartier salute. He would reply perhaps with a military salute, and whether or no I am a gentleman, it is unlikely that anyone would employ me as a groom. But even when stated thus, the connection does, in a sense, begin to suggest itself. A military salute is a manly and open gesture, expanding the figure, because the whole relation is recognized and necessary, and men are not half ashamed of it. And so, if I take off my hat to a lady with a sweeping bow, trailing, if possible, a long curling feather in the dust, that also is a consistent and honorable motion. It is not a lowering, but rather an enlargement and liberation of the body and soul. But touching the hat, as the servants of the rich are expected to do it, is a small gesture, and even a cramped gesture, nay, even an incomplete gesture. It expresses respect and not reverence. Reverence means that a thing is in some way revered, and that means some movement of more or less mystical emotions. But respect only means that the thing is respectable, and respectability of that sort means merely that it keeps a gig, or more probably a motor car. The man does respect mere wealth and luxury, but the image of God in him is ashamed of respecting them, and therefore the very gesture with which he hails it is both hampered and hurried. The worship of this world, to do it justice, is half a hypocrisy. Therefore these very antics and attitudes of it are as wooden as a dance of Dutch dolls. No gentleman feels like this about saluting a lady, because there is a sort of legend of divinity about the dignity of woman. No soldier feels this about saluting a flag, because patriotism partakes almost of a religion. No believer feels it about saluting an altar, because it is religion. All these motions, lifting the hand, uncovering the head, kneeling, or for that matter rolling on the ground and kicking, are all gestures that can be completed, that can be rounded in full. A man need not feel ashamed of them, and a man does feel ashamed of saluting mere plutocracy. But there was a time when men were not ashamed of saluting aristocracy, though perhaps it was very long ago, much earlier than most people imagine. It was in the true period of feudalism, really before the beginning of the true period of medievalism. It belonged to the genuine dark ages, of which the Song of Roland is one of the few monuments, but that one, a mighty monument, like a mountain. This is, of course, only one of the thousands of truths brought out in Captain Scott Moncrief's able and admirable tour de force. He has dealt with the difficulty of any translation in a very original and yet practical fashion of his own. That is, he has translated with strict and unfaltering fidelity. Professor Stainsbury says it is nearer to the original than any other version he has read. And such exactitude, of course, renders impossible what is commonly called rhyme, 
So he has substituted a sort of rude but resonant assonance, a broken resemblance to rhyme, like rolling echoes in the high rocks of the Pyrenees. This involves a certain quaintness in the cast of the sentence that seems barbaric but not inappropriate, and the endings are as near as translation can come to the untranslatable tongue of a people. To that gn in the old French that is like the clang and groan of iron and of bronze. It has many other merits besides technical ones, and there are lines which, literal as they are, are like fine lines first written in English, as when Roland breaks his horn with a last blow, fallen from it the crystal and the gold. But though there are a hundred other paths over this Perean height, if I may be allowed to follow my own, I would repeat that for these men of the Dark Ages, feudalism was an enthusiasm like nationalism, so that their service was not servile. And nothing remains of it now except the few ritual actions, still more free than the meaner modern actions, such as that accolade with the sword which now ennobles our least honest grocers and soap boilers. It is perhaps little better than a pun, but it is something better than a pedantry, to say that the chanson des guests might be translated as the song of gesture. I mean that the epic element partly consists in the idea that the action speaks for itself. Something that a man does seems to sum up everything that men in lesser forms of literature sing or speak or study or record. It is Ulysses bending his own bow that says all that could be said, as well as all that could never be said, about his title deeds to his own house or his wedding with his own wife. In something of this epic action, even in the more momentary sense of gesture, runs all through even the rugged and almost barbaric epic. Something of what Cyrano felt when he flung his last coin and cried, My quel guest, recurs in the Chanson de Guest. The Song of Roland is full of this sort of heroic pantomime. Roland moves through the story with sweeping and gigantic gestures like a man working miracles. But the miracles are also a sort of dumb parables. He blows his horn, he breaks his sword, rather he breaks the mountain in trying to break his sword. And all these things are spontaneous and even unconscious symbols, like those of a dumb demigod. Above all, they have this stamp of the subtle simplicity of the epic, that the symbols themselves are deeper than any words in which we can describe what they symbolize. But there are two of these vast gestures of the hero, these mere movements of his mighty hand, that remain in the memory like sublime sculpture. More clearly, I fancy, even than the breaking of the rocks or the blowing of the horn. They are gestures almost similar and yet strangely contrasted, and they express that paradox of pride and humility, of enjoyment of the world and disdain of it, which our pagan pacifists can never understand. One of them is where it is told of Roland that he stood before Charlemagne with a red and green apple in his hand and held it out to the king, offering him all the kingdoms of the world. And the other is when the paladin, in the last pangs of death and a dying confession of his sins, holds up his glove to God. These things give a far nobler meaning to the title of a man in action. The words have not only been worked to death, but to damnation, dragged in all the mire of modern materialism and rascality. A man of action has come to mean a man who does things without talking about them, because they will not bear talking about. The strong, silent man is silent for the same reason as the spy and the pickpocket. He does not speak of his deeds because they are unspeakable, and especially because they are unspeakably petty. But there is a kind of action which is larger and not smaller than any utterance. There is even a kind of dumb show that is clearer and not more cloudy than any definition. Such are the large and lucid actions of the heroes of the epics, and in them alone there is a meaning in the meaningless catchword about the value of deeds and not words. It is hardly an exaggeration to say that the man of action had better not act unless he can act poetry. He had better write poetry, as most ordinary people do. The Tennysonian tag about echoes is true, like many Victorian platitudes. The horn of Roland, unlike the horns of Elfland, really does roll from soul to soul and grow forever and forever. The enthusiasm of a rising and very critical critic like Mr. Scott Moncrief is a type of its renewal. There is something of immortal moment about that image of the king in his court riding home in triumph and hearing from the dark past behind them the dreadful note of doom. Indeed, it is very like our present position, when our rulers are supposed to have triumphed and made peace, 
and through the chorus of praise come wild unaccountable voices from poland and italy and the intolerable irony of ireland however it be explained or applied there remains arrested for ever the pageant of that halted march the great king is going home in glory and the traitor rides at his right hand the fair fields of the larger land lie before them in the sun when the echoes of the mighty horn come to them over the hollow mountains telling them the ancient tale that the best is betrayed and left behind end of section five section six of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen nineteen to nineteen twenty this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Stevenson G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns The New Witness, 1919-1920 to By G. K. Chesterton Section 6 A Christmas Letter to Sir Alfred Mond By G. K. Chesterton Sir, we are still very close to Christmas, which should be a time of broad grins rather than supercilious sneers, and I do desire quite sincerely that the smile naturally evoked by your name should be as genial as possible. So I will begin by thanking you very heartily for a handsome advertisement, for my publishers may well be tempted to placard various empty spaces with the statement that no less a person than Sir Alfred Mond says that Mr. Chesterton is the man who writes all those funny books. Perhaps they will bring out a Mond edition of Chesterton with your portrait on each cover. They may or may not accept the logical inference you drew, that a man who writes funny books must be entirely irresponsible for all of his actions. But I am not disputing about that just now. Let it be agreed, for the moment, at least, that I am quite irresponsible. Nobody, I admit, can retort the charge upon you. You are quite responsible. You are responsible for quite a number of things. They cover a wide field, and range from remembering what your ancestors the Druids did at Stonehenge, to not remembering what your compatriot, the Lord Chief Justice, did on the Stock Exchange. They include more important things, of which I will make further mention in a moment, but I am beginning here with the phrase you used about me. In the course of your legal action for libel against Captain Beamish and Captain Fraser, you explained that you had not so replied to my arguments, because I was only amusing and irresponsible. This may or may not be a compliment to me, but obviously it is a very genuine compliment to them. Captain Beamish and Captain Fraser, at least, are in your eyes serious and representative public men. For if you would not attack me because I am irrational and irresponsible, it follows that you did attack them because they were rational and responsible. Now this interests me very much, because as a matter of fact my own position has always differed from that of Captain Beamish and Captain Fraser. It does not prevent me from admiring their unquestionable courage and sincerity. And if they are charged with extravagant fanaticism, the fault is largely with that cowardly habit of political silence which nobody but a fanatic can rouse to any sort of reply. It would be your fault if nothing short of a stone thrown at your window by some wild fellow in the street could avail to reassure and delight the crowd with the appearance of your face. But anyhow, you can hardly charge these men with madness, since you have admittedly prosecuted them for their sanity. And that is what interests and even amuses me. I am ready to assume that you did not answer me because I was too frivolous, too fantastic, or, if I may use the image, too slight a figure. But I confess it would never have occurred to me that Captain Beamish and Captain Fraser would actually be selected for their moderation and exact balance of mind, as men whose solidity and sanity of political thought was beyond cavil. My own respect for them is founded on somewhat different qualities from those which you seem to have seen and saluted in them, when you chose them as your really responsible opponents. They are very likely better men than you or I, and certainly braver men than most, but I do not think they are more responsible men than I am. And, between ourselves, Sir Alfred, I do not think you think so either. I suggest to you, with all delicacy, that it will not do. You did not leave the new witness alone because it was less responsible, but because it was more responsible. You declined to challenge us precisely because you knew that our standpoint would be more sane and therefore more strong, that our theses would be more moderate and therefore more easily proved. 
As for my own small part in the matter, my position was always unmistakable and is still unchanged. I myself never called you a traitor, or never without making clear in the context the view which differentiates the thing from literal treason. I did not regard you as a traitor, if only for the primary reason that I did regard you as a foreigner. To betray England it is necessary to be an Englishman, and you are not an Englishman. Nor, I willingly admit, are you a German, or even a European. For all I know, the courts of law may decide that you are an Englishman. For all I know, the courts of law may decide that Mr. Jack Johnson is a white man. He is certainly a member of a more manly and magnanimous profession than either a financier's or a politician's. But I fear even an act of Parliament could not make Mr. Johnson look as white as Monsieur Carpentier, nor could it make you look like John Bull or even like Mr. Bottomley. It is already agreed that you do not even look like the average tow-haired, turnip-faced German. You look like what you are, and everybody knows what you are, a cosmopolitan Jew of the sort of family that comes through Germany that may turn up in twenty different countries indifferently, but generally happens to linger longest in Germany, and has a great deal of German culture clinging to it. You are not a German, but you are a German Jew, a certain historic type of Jew for which the Jews themselves have a separate name. What you do not understand is this, that when considering our own country's welfare, we do not think such German Jews less dangerous than Germans, but more dangerous than Germans. A German who is a spy can be shot. An Englishman who is a traitor can be shot. But your intermediate and false position often blinds us, and may possibly blind you. Besides, the prestige of the true German did depend on some good tradition, such as music, while the prestige of the financier depends on nothing but money. I will never admit that the music-making native of Germany is more dangerous than the money-making alien from Germany. I will never admit that her Bach is worse than her bite. The danger of the latter alien is exactly that he does not even feel like an enemy. He does not see the difference, as I might not see the difference between Confucians and Taoists if I lived in China. What he ought to do is to resign his public posts in war. Some did it, and whether they were Jews or Germans, they were gentlemen. Now in the case just concluded, there were many things that remain mysterious to me, and as it had to be run on lines different from mine, I do not understand them yet. Mr. Percival Smith's position was probably distinct from either, though an impudent attempt was made to deny his claim as a barrister, and class him with clients with whom he happened to agree on some things. Apparently the traditions of the bar would be blasted if a barrister should, for one moment, believe what he said. But as an example of what I mean, whatever anyone else means, I would take the minute of your company printed elsewhere in this issue. I have said that if I am irresponsible, you at least are responsible. Among other things, I imagine, for your own company's meetings under your own presidency. Now, I believe it seemed quite natural and harmless for you to use or hear used those words about the secretary having promised to look after the interests of certain aliens in Germany. I cannot make head or tail of how these words can be reconciled with the idea that their interests were not being considered at all. Those words in wartime seem to me unnatural and shocking. If they seemed to you shocking, you allowed them, and you are a worse man than I think you. If they do not seem to you shocking, you are what I think you, and the principle of this paper is justified. In other words, you saw a network of inevitable Anglo-German business, where we saw a sword that had cut that net like a cobweb. Perhaps you were happy in that ignorance, or innocence. Perhaps, indeed, there is a better word for you than ignorant or innocent. If I wanted the mot juste, if I were to search fastidiously for a fresh and fitting term for the thing I mean, I think I should take the liberty of calling it irresponsible. On the eve of one of those festivals of hearth and altar, from which you and your people are unfortunately shut out, I speak truly more in sorrow than in anger. But it is true that you have no real responsibility to the realms in which you travel and trade. In the tragic sense in which we knew it, you are not responsible to anything, unless indeed it be to Israel and the God of your fathers. I hope it is. Yours without annoyance or apology, G. K. Chesterton. End of section 6. Section 7 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919-1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. I have recently given myself a present of a toy bow and arrows, and started happily to lose all the arrows in the trees and the tops of houses, in a way that brings back all the paradise of boyhood. But in the course of losing them, I have learned something of the sort that I did not learn in boyhood. I have been interested to notice a certain quality in the very nature even of such amateur archery. A quality belongs to the bow, which belongs to a number of things our fathers used in that best period of civilization when it was not too civilized. Its shortest description is a sense of liberty. Its more exact definition is a power of infinite mastery and manipulation of degree. That is, one can not only do a thing, but do it more or less down to the finest shade of difference. I have noticed the same thing about another of the older and more natural implements, a quill pen, which is both lighter and more flexible than a steel pen. We have all heard that things in the West are reversed in the East, so that their very writing runs backwards, and it is said that the Japanese can write with a paintbrush, as Europeans can draw with a pen. But writing with a quill suggests something of the freedom of writing with a paintbrush, and the quill comes from the same sort of flying wild fowl, the types of freedom, from which come the feathers of the arrows. You can launch an arrow lightly or heavily. You can send it so that it seems to go like a thunderbolt, or so as to alight, by comparison, like a falling leaf. At least you can do it with a boy's bow, and in the former case I can feel as if I were the angel of death, and in the latter enact the more congenial character of the god of love. You cannot do this with firearms, which are, after all, modern machines, and therefore have something in them that goes beyond the purpose of man their maker. You cannot fire off a cannon at a wealthy neighbor walking down the street so that the cannonball alights on the tip of his nose and bounds harmlessly away. You can do something like this with a toy arrow, and it is my intention to try. For instance, I do not believe in political assassination, and I am sorry it has broken out again in Ireland. If Lord French had been killed, I should have felt bound in some sense to respect him as a soldier who had died doing what he thought his duty. And Lord French has played the fool far too much lately to deserve to die like that. But I might have tickled him up with my toy arrows to the individual satisfaction of the Commonwealth. I do not want Mr. Lloyd George to be shot, but I should like him shot a little. And you cannot shoot a man a little with a rifle or a revolver. You can, as the phrase goes, wing him if one can even metaphorically conceive a politician as clad with wings. But that is only a local hurt, not a lesser hurt. It does not give the pistol the fine levity of the pea-shooter. I want the Prime Minister not really murdered, but rather murdered. And the nearest approach to that could be managed with a toy bow and arrows. In short, the gun, as compared with the bow, may very well be taken as a type of what may be called German civilization. It even bears a certain resemblance to German strategy. For the point is that when the cannonball has left the cannon, and is once on its way towards the Prime Minister, I have no more control over the cannonball. It will travel to the full extent of a fixed mechanical range, not specially fitted to the individual case. I cannot pat the Prime Minister with the cannonball, or stroke him with the cannonball, or merely give him a good hard knock with the cannonball. I cannot change my mind at the last moment, and let it swerve in its course to take in Mr. Montague and Sir Auckland Geddes. Perfection in this purpose can only be obtained by some weapon even simpler than the bow, the sword, or even the stick. But just as the gun would launch the missile, so the German strategic school launched the whole military assault. It went like clockwork, and it could not mend itself any more than clockwork. Opposed to it was that other spirit, at once more subtle and more simple, which watches and waits for opportunity, which modifies itself for the occasion and is not ashamed of changing its mind. A machine cannot change its mind because it has no mind to change. What Joffre meant by nibbling the Germans is very much what I mean by tickling the Prime Minister. For those to whom civilization does not mean merely complexity, that is clockwork, the very highest civilization always consists of a certain artistic mastery of degree, a power over proportion, vested in personality. In less pedantic words, the highest flower of the highest civilization is liberty. By our contention, the fruit of which that is the flower is property. The point about property, in its smaller and saner sense, is that matter is subject to just this infinite modification of treatment, a modification much too delicate for definition. 
I cannot receive directions from an official, or report to an official, or even be responsible to an official, about exactly what I want to do with my little bow and arrows. I can accept certain rigid but exceptional rules laid down in the form of vetoes, as that I must not shoot the Baptist minister even through the hat for fear of shooting him through the head, or at any rate in the eye. But I cannot explain to the Baptist minister, and still less to the policeman, why I wish sometimes to shoot an arrow far into the air and let it fall in exactly the same place, which it seldom does, and why I sometimes rejoice in the very thought that it will never return at all. I can accept a negative rule that I must not break my neighbor's windows, but I cannot explain the exact risk I run of breaking my own windows, or why it is gratifying to have very nearly broken them. And if I cannot break my own windows for the mere whim of shooting a toy arrow, then I live no longer in a free country. Of course it will be answered that my bow is only a toy, and that even social reform does not propose to interfere with toys. I am not so sure about this, for I should never be surprised if the anti-militarists succeeded in forbidding children to play with soldiers, or even if my little bow were held suggestive of the long bow of my medieval and romantic exaggerations of history. But I have also a more solid and serious answer, which is this that the evil trend of social reform is proved in the very fact that I have to fall back on the example of a toy. It is a trifle, and the citizen is now not allowed any liberty or lordship except over trifles. In a healthy state, many things better worth doing, even than playing the fool, would proceed from the personal initiative of the citizen. At present, everything proceeds to the citizen, and is accepted by him when it is not merely imposed upon him. He is not the archer, but the target, the mark for every shaft of official folly or educational fadism. In a healthy state, his force would be centrifugal as well as centripetal, and he would scatter something better than a boy's arrows. As it is, we might very well see the day when the citizen is not allowed tools, but only allowed toys. Lest he should develop the stubborn individualism of the peasant, he will perhaps be forbidden a spade and watering pot in his own garden, and only allowed a spade and pail at the seaside that hygienic resort. Lest woman be again degraded by the horrors of domesticity, she may be forbidden to have a house, and only allowed to have a doll's house. It would not be the only way in which the state is treating us as if we were all infants. But considering what the state does, even to infants, I think it much more likely that it will not allow the adults to own anything at all. With the gloom and gravity of a defeated general who gives up his sword, I shall give up my little bow and arrows." Meanwhile, I am still allowed to play with it in the garden, much to my gratification, for to my taste a winter garden is even more fascinating than a summer one. The trees are a more delicate tracery, the skies have a more subtle color, and a soft and yet mighty wind is bending all those slender trees into the curves of countless bows, with a sound as of countless bowstrings. With the sweep of the lines and the light thunder of the sound, there drifts back into my memory that glorious dream of Mr. Arthur Matchin, where an army of dead archers cried, Array! around the white horse of our paladin and patron. I could fancy that the last birds darting here and there were bolts flying above a battle, and that the very forests were bowed in great resistance all around me, like the bending of the bows of England. End of Section 7 Section 8 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919-1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Aaron Stevenson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919-1920. By G. K. Chesterton. Section 8. The Consistency of Mr. Snowden. By G. K. Chesterton. Many will look at dusty old folios in a library who would not look at dusty old files in a newspaper office, and so the history that is really most recent seems to be most remote. The papers of yesterday have faded more completely than the snows of yesteryear, for nobody has written even a ballade about them. Every detached critic of public affairs must have noticed that there is a sort of neglected interregnum of politics, of which few, especially of the rising generation, realize anything at all. 
it is just too new to be history and just too old to be news. This peculiarity of politics is, of course, a convenience for politicians. For a politician with a future means a politician with a forgotten past. But I have been surprised to notice in the course of turning over the newspapers how completely it generally is forgotten. It is needless to say that the journalists do not always tell the truth about the politicians. What surprises me is that so very often, it would seem, they do not even know the truth about them. But this becomes much more comprehensible when we realize how very short is the period of the past about which they do profess to know. It is almost as if Fleet Street were entirely inhabited by infants in arms, though I do not know whose arms, and as if the really experienced veterans of the press were about three years old. For instance, I saw in one of the best of the evening papers the other day the statement that a certain constituency had a long memory. The prehistoric persistence of its memory appeared to consist in the fact that it has not forgotten the Great War with Germany. That traditional event, lost in the mists of antiquity, was remembered in this particular case to the disadvantage, I am happy to say, of Mr. Philip Snowden. Other critics and nations may have grown up in ignorance of it, but this one tenacious tribe still remembers that Mr. Snowden was not exactly a paladin of patriotism in that dim and distant crusade. Now I have no doubt that the voters in this constituency do indeed realize that, during the war, Mr. Snowden did not support the government. What they possibly do not realize is that the government did support Mr. Snowden. While Mr. Snowden was preaching a pacifist panic in the crisis of battle, Mr. George and the politicians allowed him an official seat on the Liquor Control Board, and gave him the power to dilute, dole out, or filch away the beer of a people that was giving its blood. That is one example of the sort of enormous fact, of very recent date, which the journalists apparently do not know, and certainly do not tell. Possibly they do not tell it, because it reflects even more on a man like Mr. George than on a man like Mr. Snowden. But that is not the example with which I am immediately concerned here. What seems to me still more remarkable is this. The evening paper in question was concerned to point out that some of those whom it vaguely calls extremists in labor politics— they might be extreme Muslims or extreme Mormons for all the value of the description, feel a link with Mr. Snowden because of his anti-national notions about the ethics of arms. But it added, very truly, that they are not altogether at one with him in some other revolutionary proposals. The paper suggested that Mr. Snowden was, from the extremist point of view, shaky about direct action. And it added, almost as if with hesitation, that Mr. Snowden seems on one occasion to have discouraged a particular strike. Now I suppose that journalists may be excused for not having taken note of the principles of a politician, because a politician so seldom has any principles. But to do Mr. Snowden justice, if there is one principle irrevocably riveted to his personality, if there is one principle he has made quite plain and maintained for a long period, it is the principle of his absolute abomination of strikes. He has incessantly written against strikes, spoken against strikes, worked and maneuvered against strikes, against all strikes, against any strike, against the very principle and nature of any strike. He has not done this in abrupt panic, or belated reaction over some exceptional example. It is due to his consistency to say that he did it from the very beginning of his political career, and chiefly in the period of the great strikes before the war. Not knowing that Mr. Snowden is against strikes is like not knowing that Carson is against home rule, or that Mr. Harold Cox is against socialism. He is against strikes as he is against beer. He is against strikes as he is against soldiers, and for the same reason. Save in that one secluded village, to which the paper referred, where totters and daughters in senile decay, the oldest inhabitant who remembers the advance on the Somme, and the retreat from St. Quentin, it were vain indeed to look for anybody who remembers the labor controversies before the war. But as a fact, the late editor of the New Witness, whose memory is not unconnected with the tragedy of the war, enjoyed himself very much in the comedy of the controversy. And I remember him reviewing, in a very vigorous fashion, a sort of small book or pamphlet which Mr. Snowden wrote with the sole object of stopping strikes. In that review, my brother pointed out that Mr. Snowden was opposed to all strikes, exactly as he was opposed to wars, because he did not feel that manhood and moral dignity demand renunciation and defiance, at a certain point of oppression, whatever the risk, or even the result may be. As he said, such defiance may end in defeat, but it is sometimes a duty to risk defeat instead of disgrace. 
But the case is even more curious than this. Not only is this anti-strike spirit the true sense in which Mr. Snowden is a pacifist, it is also the equally true sense in which he is a pro-German. He disliked fighting Prussia, partly because he disliked fighting anybody, but he also disliked fighting Prussia simply because he liked Prussia. His gentle soul would have been much more torn with temptation if there had been a chance of invading France. Sirens far sweeter, even if equally sinful, would have lured his soul to the prospect of oppressing Poland. And here again he is wholly consistent. For instance, to recur once more to old, unhappy, far-off things and battles long ago, Mr. Snowden, in the middle of the war, urged it as an objection to France recovering her property of Alsace that the German labor legislation was more advanced than the French. This means, of course, that the German labor legislation is more advanced in the direction of forced labor. It is not at all hard to see what he means by commending all that type of culture and humane government which we associate with the name of Zabern. A crippled cobbler was wantonly cut down with a saber in that town, but Mr. Snowden thinks that such a cobbler has his compensations, even if he got no compensation. He is covered with a complex network of state regulations, not only designed to prevent the cobbler going beyond his last, but to prevent him from going the length of his last, from treating it as his own last at all. Thus, such a regulation takes care of a part of the cobbler's own wages for him. Money that other people have paid him to mend their shoes and forcibly allots it to one particular purpose, whether he likes it or not. He must not spend it on any individual notion or any immediate need. If the cobbler is of one way of thinking, he must not spend it on putting up candles to St. Crispin, the patron saint of cobblers. If he is of the other way of thinking, he must not spend it on buying by installments the Lives of Atheistic Cobblers, that solid and handsome series published by the Rationalist Press Association. Least of all, of course, must he pay it into the funds of the voluntary organization of the Guild of Cobblers, for the purpose of a collective bargain or a strike. That portion of his own hard-earned money is forcibly set aside for the day on which he shall be afflicted with the disease of cobbler's collarbone, which no less a person than Professor Smuts has proved to be the inevitable fate of 1.25 cobblers out of every 99.05 of the members of that trade. This is the sort of thing that is meant by having the protection of advanced labor legislation. And Mr. Snowden feels that, for a cobbler so protected, being cut about with a saber is, after all, only a minor inconvenience, and almost a mystical form of paternal government. For, after all, there is little difference between the medical and the military coercion, if both are done by the sacred authority of the state. To be hacked with a surgeon's knife against your will, and to be hacked with a soldier's sword against your will, are both things that may be theoretically for your own good, or for the good of the social system to which you belong. This bureaucratic argument is quite consistent, and naturally anyone who approves of it will disapprove of the strike. A strike is a spontaneous and unofficial organization from below, based on the idea that the labor of men is voluntary. Of course, it is possible that Mr. Snowden has since altered his mind, and seeing that the strike can sometimes be used against patriotism, has consented to allow it to be used even against plutocracy. In that case, he has lost his last link of logic, and become a politician indeed. End of section 8. Recording by Aaron Stevenson. Section 9 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919 1920, by G. K. Chesterton. At the sign of the world's end, the religion of the reindeer. If I take a convenient text from the attractive opening pages of Mr. Wells' world history, it will not be mistaken, I hope, for an unjust generalization from the first chapters in absence of the last. Indeed, the only generalization I might venture to make is that these interesting chapters ought to be the last chapters, not the first. Every word of them should be published and every word of them should be read. But in a sense I should find them more convincing as a fascinating appendix than as a formal preface. If I could imagine myself capable of writing so learned 
and many-sided a work at all i think i should have put planets and protoplasm and primitive men into the story of the nineteenth century whether or no these things or some of them were the great events of the ice age or the stone age they were certainly the great events of our own age or of the age of our aunts and uncles in short i should introduce darwinism with darwin as i should introduce calvinism with calvin elements of predestination elements of evolution are indeed as old as the world but it was these definite departures alone that made them the first principle and foundation of the world thus the geological eons of the agnostics could be treated like the livelier eons of the gnostics that is they could be treated as the hypotheses of a highly interesting set of men mr wells might well have waited till he was past the french revolution and the first industrial movements and then told us of that group of very great men whose scientific labors were the glory of the victorian age and who advanced like calvin and the gnostics one very striking theory of the genesis of things then we could have had all the mammoths and the megaliths just the same then we could have wallowed in the primeval slime with all the pleasure i have just felt in reading his first pages but the missing link could go with the devil and the demiurge and other religious figures in perfect religious equality let it be noted that i say that the missing link can go with the devil and not what a more hasty reader might happen to think i said mr wells might well conclude that chapter but that modesty would probably prevent him by saying that none was greater in that great scientific century than one whom it produced before its close a prose poet of science whose fictions were so imaginatively true that they might as well be as immortal as fairy tales when all their facts had been shown to be falsehoods but as it happens i am only taking an accidental example of something of which mr wells can by no means be exhibited as an awful example on the contrary he is in this as in many things refreshingly free from the extreme faults of his school i mean that deadly denial of the brotherhood of men which has made many materialists exult indecently in the alleged filth and degradation and deformity of the first men of the earth for it is at least as necessary to have a sense of human equality about the prehistoric as about the proletarian i believe that this was simply one of the bad habits of black industrialism and that its motive was brutally reactionary men were taught so much about slow evolution that they might be patient with equally slow progress they were told that their fathers were covered with hair that they might be the less surprised at being covered with rags and they were assured that primitive man always ate his grandmother to reconcile them to the experience of not having much else to eat mr wells's first chapters are an agreeable and honourable change from the tone of the first anthropologists about the first anthropoids they had to blacken the past very much to make it blacker than the present he throws upon the past something of that quickening sunlight of imagination that he often throws upon the future when he says that a primitive man was too intelligent and too like ourselves not to have a language we can feel the change from the cheap science that made him so stupid and so unlike ourselves as hardly to have a head on his shoulders if therefore i find something to criticize in his version of primitive evolution i am taking the thing at its best and not its worst and i think that even in this its finest form there is something to criticize it seems to me that the guesses about the prehistoric make it out much too historic i mean that even when they have imagination and sympathy instead of dullness and disgust they still have not enough data for instance it is part of mr wells's purpose to show that religion was as he expresses it a growth indeed religion was as he explains it a growth from quite scattered and separate seeds like trees with different roots entangled at the top a bewilderment about dreams a fear of the tribal chief here familiarly called the old man an accidental discovery of grain a doubt whether the dead were really dead these separate and intrinsically secular things came together and somehow formed the spiritual thing we know 
i may remark here that this explanation strikes me as very unconvincing as a matter of mere psychology that motley material accidents should make up an ultimately indivisible idea seems much less likely than the old story that a mystical tradition lingered long after some mystical event i might be surprised to learn that our distant descendants will develop some entirely new emotion inconceivable to us but so urgent to them that they will break their hearts as for a love affair or fall fighting as for a flag but i should not only be surprised but somewhat sceptical if i were told that this simple enthusiasm will be developed by combining commonplace and utterly different things of our own day that it will be a mixture of the hurry to catch a train the pleasure of smoking a good cigar the difficulty of learning the foxtrot and the difference between butter and margarine i do not see why these things should combine into one emotion and i do not think they will nor do i think it of the primitive material accidents if they were only material accidents surely it is much more consonant to common sense to suppose that there was already a mystical sentiment and that in the light of that dreams seemed marvellous and the dead immortal and the deeds of men waited with doom but the point that took my attention was this that in connection with this general idea of the slow growth of religion mr wells suggests that the primitive men for whose spirited drawings of reindeers and other animals he expresses a refreshing regard do not seem to have had any particular religious feelings this is what i mean by the best anthropology being curiously dogmatic with curiously inadequate data it is apparently based upon nothing better than the impression that the figure of the reindeer is frankly and fearlessly drawn and that there is none among these figures than can be identified as a religious symbol i can hardly imagine fainter evidence or a thinner thread of argument than this which reconstructs the very inmost moods of the prehistoric mind from the fact that somebody who has left a few drawings on a rock from what motive we do not know for what purpose we do not know acting under what customs and conventions we do not know happened to find it easier to draw a reindeer than to draw his own dream of spiritual perfection he might have drawn a reindeer because it was his religious symbol even more probably he might have drawn it because it was not his religious symbol he might have drawn everything except his religious symbol in any case it is an amazing leap of logic to deduce that he had no religious symbol and another to deduce even from the fact that he had no religious symbol the idea that he had no religion there really is not evidence enough for any of these remote reconstructions even the most ignorant of us have the right to say so when the reconstructionists actually give us the evidence that convinces them and it fails signally to convince us so far as the free draftsmanship of the reindeer man suggests anything it would rather suggest the opposite not directly but indirectly because a man intelligent enough to be an artist might well be intelligent enough to be a philosopher some slight interest in transcendental truth did not wholly enfeeble the fearless draftsmanship of michael angelo or of blake End of section nine section ten of g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen nineteen to nineteen twenty this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org g k chesterton's newspaper columns the new witness nineteen nineteen to nineteen twenty by g k chesterton section ten at the side of the world's end the god and the cellar by g k chesterton i am writing these lines far away from england but even here wherever a few of the educated english are gathered together there is a little flutter of the passing fashion of spiritualism i am not at the moment concerned so much with the attitude of the spiritualist as with the antagonistic attitude of the materialist i have already suggested more than once what i think about spiritualism in the general sense of supernaturalism 
i think it is a matter of common sense that it is of experience too large to be analyzed we call a thing common sense when it suffers from too much evidence in its favor too much to be formulated or even remembered such popular impressions generally convince me not by the way in which they are proved but by the way in which they are disproved they are always disproved in detail with a different answer for each and when things have been thoroughly disproved in that way i generally suspect that they are true the materialist does not say that all ghosts are turnip ghosts which might be tested by the statistics of turnips he is willing to suggest anything and everything from the cedar to the hyacinth not excluding the hop and the vine the materialist is like a man with some new theory of the indestructibility of organisms by chemical action which should then set to work to explain away all possible examples of poisoning poisoning is seldom performed in public and never under scientific conditions such as are demanded of a seance the poisoner seldom advertises even to the extent of putting his title over his shop he is a delicate and retiring character with a fine sense of professional decorum and in consequence as a matter of fact nearly all the great poisoning cases have been matters of considerable doubt and dispute with my own very limited taste and training in poisons i could go over most of them from memory and and question them for this or that reason as ghost stories are questioned the borgia incidents might be represented as protestant stories against a pope and thence as slanders as certainly nine-tenths of the protestant stories against popes have been utterly basely slanders the marquis de brinvilliers was put to the torture and it is an axiom of enlightened research that people always preferred to tell lies under the torture curiously enough if i remember right the two most notorious and repulsive poisoning cases of the nineteenth century those of palmer and of pritchard had each a curious hitch in its legal demonstration different in the different cases those who are certain that palmer poisoned his friend are still puzzled about how he did it those who are certain that pritchard poisoned his wife are still puzzled about why he did it in my own boyhood a very real and bewildering controversy still raged round the mystery of mrs maybrick the sceptic would really have a variety of arguments it is the whole point about him that he would have too great a variety of arguments it is unnecessary to add that the sceptic would be a lunatic he would prefer his own chemical theory to common sense that is a rough recapitulation of what i myself feel about a thing like spirit rapping or table turning i think it is necessarily as occasional and as obscure as poison i think it is as real and historical as poison i also think it is about as bracing and salubrious as poison but as i say i am not so much interested just now in the assertions of the spiritualist as in the answers of the materialists for the materialists are now very much on the defensive and it is singular to note how much the nineteenth century movement is regarded even by itself as fighting a rear-guard action a high church clergyman said to me the other day in a deep and melancholy voice as if announcing himself i am the last darwinian in his solemnity there may have been a certain irony but many more solid materialists have all the vanity of the veteran warmly admiring the nineteenth century movement in many ways as i do i was much interested to hear what its more recent inheritors were saying about the more recent psychical suggestions it was the glory of the great agnostics that they had grown more agnostic because they had grown less ignorant but i found that some more recent rationalists had actually grown less agnostic where they were admittedly more ignorant i mean they are using the new psychological mysteries against the new psychical marvels and they actually argue that the one cannot be marvelous because the other is mysterious they say it is not really supernatural because it is really subconscious it happens in the unconscious mind they cannot possibly tell what happens in the unconscious mind because it is unconscious or they say it is explained by telepathy though telepathy itself cannot be explained they are sure that departed could not communicate by the mouth of a medium 
and that solely because the living can already communicate without any mouth at all a dead man cannot speak because a dumb man does speak suppose we are told by the tenant of a house that he had discovered by stamping on the floor that there must be a cellar or subterranean room below suppose he told us that he could find no entry to it that he knew nothing about it that he could not imagine whether it was large or small furnished or unfurnished papered pink green or yellow or not papered at all and then suppose he added that he was positively and solidly certain that there was not a wooden image of st francis of assisi over the mantelpiece we should think of him a little unreasonable and wonder why he should have so peculiar a prejudice against that particular piece of furniture or suppose we were told by a traveller that we had come to the last limit of the known world and that the land lying before us was uncharted and unknown in any map made by man suppose he told us that the watercourse through the wilderness might lead to anything or nothing to farms villages or cities but that it could not possibly lead either to a temple or a tomb we should think his position illogical and wonder why he should know so much on that point and so little on any other and our doubts would not be dissipated in the first case merely by being told that there really was a popular legend in the district about a sunken shrine of st francis nor in the second case by learning that the natives of the wilderness told a tale about the river winding its way towards a great temple in the interior these traditions would only tend to the traveller and the tenant already convicted of mere perversity being convicted of mere bigotry yet this is very much the situation of some thinkers calling themselves scientific touching their own thesis of the subconscious mind or the subliminal self beneath the mind is another mind of which the psychologist is unconscious as beneath the room is another room of which the tenant is ignorant but though by definition he cannot say what is there by sheer dogma he does say what is not there he is very anxious to assure us beforehand that the subconscious cannot contain the supernatural or anything of the sort that may be symbolized by the shrine there is a psychological region beyond the researches of the psychologist as there is a geographical region beyond the travels of the traveller but he is convinced that whatever it contains must confirm his own private creed of materialism like an imperial conqueror he marks out an unknown continent of which he knows nothing except that it is his and like most imperialism it is a fine combination of impudence and ignorance in truth the rationalist has already lost his reason so far as could be demanded by any religious frenzy between the new psychology and the new mathematics he is bewildered out of his five wits being often assured that two and two make the five it is not so much being half-witted as being double-witted having more wits than he knows what to do with a sixth sense a second self a subconscious mind a tangle of telepathic wires he may be agnostic about whether any of those wires stretch away into another world but i deny his right to deny it and if the spiritualist assumes that such wireless telegraphy cannot communicate with evil i ask him by way of a parable to consider the moral meaning of the word marconi which careful research may discover here and there even in the past files of this paper End of section 10. Section 11 of G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns. The New Witness, 1919 to 1920. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. G. K. Chesterton's Newspaper Columns, The New Witness, 1919-1920, by G. K. Chesterton, Section 11, The Fastidious Futurist. At the Sign of the World's End, The Fastidious Futurist. The narrowest thing in the world is novelty. Innovation wears thinner than imitation so far from liberating the mind more and more it limits the mind more and more for mere innovation 
is mere elimination. Thus my well-wishers inform me that I am in need of a new hat. But if I insist on having a new hat in the extreme sense of an entirely novel hat, I shall find that my choice of hats is really extremely small. I must not have a tall hat because it resembles a top hat. I must not have a round hat because it resembles a bowler hat. I must not have a triangular hat because it is like an old three-cornered hat. If I turn up the brim on one side, I shall recall an old romantic picture of a brigand. If I turn it up on both sides, I shall convey the shocking suggestion of a bishop. If my hat has no brim, I shall be identified as the very image of a rabbi. If it has too many brims, it will approximate to the proverbial tiara of the old clothes man. And as I am a morbid and sanguinary anti-Semite, both of these resemblances will be distasteful. The most intelligent example I know of feminist freedom and the equality of the sexes may be seen when Ari and Ariet, those pioneers of the higher comradeship, change hats on a bank holiday. There is quite as much high philosophy in it as there is in shuffling the social functions of the sexes, in turning women into demagogues and men into pacifists. And there is much more high spirits in it than is common in feminist books and articles, and high spirits are things considerably higher than higher thought. In short, I think it much better that the sexes should change hats than that they should change heads. But my own peculiar problem of the hat of the future, the hat that never was on sea or land, cannot be solved even by a bank holiday on Hampstead Heath. My appearance in a lady's hat, fascinating and even striking as such an appearance might be, would not be, by the present definition, the appearance of a new hat. Wide and fresh as would be the new field of choice open to me, in the matters of flowers, ribbons, feathers, and such on it, it would only be the flowers that were fresh and not the hat that they adorned. That would still be subject to the laws of cut and pattern ruling the brigand and the bishop, and I should still suffer from the crowding competition of my fathers. It is obvious that in order to get a really original hat, I should have to act in a fashion that was fastidious as well as fantastic. I should have to seek out, so to speak, in some crooked street of some grotesque city, the original shop of the proverbial Mad Hatter. There may be a mathematical shape that has never yet been embodied in a hat, even in dreams. Let us say something between a rhombus and an oblate spheroid. Let us say, for the sake of argument, that nobody has worn a hexagonal hat, and that I appear in one with simple pride, and am really the object of remark or even of riot. There is still a further fact to be fancied in the matter, that the chances are considerably against the new but neglected type of headdress having anything to recommend it except its novelty. The conventional critic commonly refers to an old hat when he speaks of a shocking bad hat. But, in truth, the new hat would probably have to be a shocking bad hat, since its only object is to shock. The Mad Hatter would have to be a Bad Hatter, or at least the designer and creator of a bad hat, if only by the exhaustion of comparatively good hats. In other words, there is something in the very nature of novelty, or what some call progress, which tends to grow worse and worse. It not only becomes something lower, but especially something more limited. He who perpetually puts his head into newer and newer and newer hats is also putting his head into narrower and narrower holes. I have made the apologue crude in order to make it clear, and it is not more crude than some of the innovations in ethics and especially in aesthetics. A modern atheist is really discouraged from doing what has been done before, even if he can do it better just as a fashionable woman might be discouraged from wearing an unfashionable hat, even if she looked divinely beautiful in it. 
I have never understood why painters, whose work is in some ways more public and permanent than is all the flutter and litter of our written and printed sheets, should be so much more fussy and fastidious than we are in distinguishing between a flutter of new things and a litter of old ones. I do not understand why, while our own vulgar headlines remain comparatively fixed, like an epithet, their pictures are expected to change incessantly like a cinema. It is as if the painters had to keep pace with the popular phrase, which always calls a cinema the pictures. A young writer is not always painting to prove that he despises Swinburne's temple of Proserpina as a rubbish heap, or even that he has said farewell to it as a ruin. But a young painter is extraordinarily anxious to assure us that he has escaped from Whistler's peacock room as from a prison. A critic of public affairs is not necessarily ashamed of still being a socialist or a rationalist or a ritualist, but an artist in paint or marble will be in an agony if he is suspected of still being a post-impressionist when he ought to be a post-post-impressionist. It is not obvious why the painter should be so much afraid of being behind the times, while the poet can still retain his modest hope of being not for an age but for all times. But it can never be denied that one or two of the greatest of these pictorial innovators have an idea too subtle to be fairly compared to a grotesque fashion in hats. Behind their ambition there is an artistic theory, though I think an insufficient one, and it is not always the silly notion of novelty, but sometimes the noble idea of renewal. There are two senses in which an artist may work to awaken wonder. One is the basest and vulgarest kind of art, the other is the highest and holiest kind of art. The former is meant to make us wonder at the artist, the latter is meant to make us wonder at the world. Now I do believe that a few men of genius, chiefly French, originally set out in a finer spirit to paint a three-legged stool in a startling fashion. They were cheap jacks and charlatans, if they only tried to startle us with the painting. But they were poets and prophets if they tried to startle us with the stool. Many of their sect have truly argued that much of the more primitive painting, such as the early medieval painting, has a convincing directness which is difficult even to disentangle from its faulty drawing or quaint perspective. There is an unconscious solidity about the furniture in some primitive pictures, because the three-legged stool is not standing on one leg to have its portrait painted. If it is out of drawing, it is, so to speak, caught out by accident. I suppose that the more genuine new artists set out to seize this quality, at once abrupt and absolute, and the only way they could draw the stool afresh was to draw it askew. But when all this is understood, touching the best of them, even the best are still the victims of a finer form of the same fallacy of fastidiousness. They are narrow even when they are new, because they arrive at novelty only by a process of exhaustion. It is in a literal and a double sense exhaustion, because it is fatigue. They are pricking and prodding to find the one live spot, as the old witch-finders pricked and prodded to find the one dead spot. But it is because most of the new victim is dead, as most of the old victim was alive. They are trying to find a new nerve of surprise, but that alone shows that the normal nerves are abnormally jaded. The difference between them and the medieval primitives is that they are not fresh minds appealing to other fresh minds, but stale minds appealing to other stale minds, even if the best of them are still making an effort to startle themselves out of their staleness. And I fancy any fair critic will be forced to find the distinction in the difference between the spiritual philosophy and the atmosphere of the two epochs. The medieval man had solidity in his creed as well as his craft. He had simplicity in his soul as well as his style. 
the primitive of the present day does not after all draw his stool as if he had left all other stools for lumber not as if he had ever seen a stool before he actually selects ugly things as the aesthete in the last fashion selected beautiful things he tries to be as crude as a simple man and yet as superior as a sophisticated man and so to continue the metaphor he falls between two stools. End of section 11. End of G. K. Chesterton's newspaper columns, The New Witness, 1919 to 1920, by G. K. Chesterton.